activists have been involved in this, uh, this area as well. Well, to get four activists on one panel at one time is going to be very interesting. Um, we've got a very diverse view here, I think. Um, but we want to try and make this as interactive as possible. So the format will be, we'll, we'll get a little intro from each person, and then we're going to open up to you to figure out what you guys are going to talk about. All right? So if we can kick it off. Hello, um, my name is Callie Blackwell and I'm a UK cannabis activist. I got into this about six years ago when I gave my son cannabis after he was given three days to live and he didn't die. And so after that I then helped other people in similar situations as myself and become a cannabis activist fighting for full decriminalisation and access for all to cannabis. Hi, I'm Dan Herr. I started uh, in the cannabis uh, space not as an activist, but as the child of an activist uh, when I was about 10. By the time I was 18, we were uh, educating folks, uh, tourists and, and uh, the, the local citizens alike down in Venice Beach. Uh, in the 1980s, my father wrote a book called The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which depicts and explains the history of cannabis, uh, not just in the U.S., but uh, how it was used and how it affected uh, countries around the globe that had used it for, you know, uh, millennials. And uh, through that, uh, I've continued uh, in the space of cannabis and hemp in the United States uh, as an activist, as an educator, as a business owner. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to share parts of my story uh, in, in order to help you, uh, you know, find uh, the truth in, in the future here and the understanding here of cannabis and hemp. Uh, hi guys, I'm Simpicata, I run Durham City Cannabis Club. Um, I work sort of in the media space with cannabis activism. I write for quite a few outlets, I'm a vlogger. Uh, the work that I mainly focus on is creating a social space and a community hub to utilize the sale of cannabis, be it industrial, recreational, medicinal, whatever divide you want to put on it, to refund the redevelopment and rebuilding of our communities that have been decimated to austerity and prohibitive policies. Hi, I'm Phil Monk, and I've got an endocannabinoid system, so therefore I should have cannabis, uh, and the prohibition of cannabis, and nearly being killed by pharmaceutical drugs many times has made me what people call a cannabis activist. Uh, so I am now what people call a human rights cannabis activist, trying to make a legal challenge against it. So. That's amazing. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I'm just going to kick this discussion off. Anybody? Hi. So, someone like myself who's looking to get into the cannabis industry, um, looking to be a retailer or a distributor, what kind of activities are going on right now that you guys are involved with that uh, the average person like myself who has limited to no knowledge of the industry but is looking to educate himself and to learn about what's going on? how we can make a difference and help the industry become more recognized and legalized. So what kind of activities are you guys involved in that uh, the average person can also join in and actually make a difference instead of just sitting on social media talking about doing something and not really doing anything about it? Do you want to cover America first and then we'll break down with the UK? Okay. So, Many people around the world are thinking that America has legal cannabis. What we have is access to cannabis, um, but there are still laws in place that, that govern that access. So there's still pathways to prison, there's still pathways to fines, uh, and, and we are um, unduly taxed uh, because of the same fears that uh, are, are undoubtedly going to happen here and what I've been hearing about. Uh, what's happening uh, with regards to um, the production of, of plant material here in, in the UK is that uh, you can grow hemp, but you can't use the tops. You can only use the stalks and the seeds. It's, it, it's the, these types of perceptions, uh, and, and this comes from the government down, not from the people up so much, is, is that this plant still needs to be feared. So the top of the plant uh, must not be used and it must be thrown away and do your best with what's left. These are the types of understandings that, that you're going to have to deal with and uh, at a community level with, with regards to 
social media and posts and, and being able to educate through that, that's great. But you need you need to be able to educate those that are uh, you know your parliamentary leaders. You, but that's very difficult because at, at a level of of government um, government you know uh, the way that they govern uh, is is based on things that they've learned over the last eight decades. And the, the last eight decades has been uh, a systematic demonization of this plant that we're all right here recognizing that there's nothing unsafe or dangerous about what is in this in this hall. But the perception of it uh, from from an application or usage within your community, like, oh, it's safe within, within this venue, but it's not safe in that field where it's growing openly, where people or, or children can get into that field. And, and dispelling uh, the falsehoods that have created the, the illegalization uh, and the demonization and, and then uh, the regulation with regards to what is being implemented here in, in Europe is no different than what we've gone through in, in the United States. So it, it comes down to education, education, education. And there's plenty of education right here, you know, going back into your history books, prior to the 1930s, you'll find that this plan has been a part of every part of the culture here in Europe for thousands of years. As, as, <clears throat> as long as there's been churches that are a thousand years old and buildings and palaces, all of these places, all used hemp, all of them used this place, of, uh, you know, used this product, uh, and, and it was highly prized. It's that education that needs to be returned back to your community so the fear can be removed from it. Um, as, as far as industry would go, I guess it's, uh, we're not, I'm not in industry, certainly, um, but I would say what I want to see from people in industry is to push for whole plant. And I know that we have to have a certain level of THC or below a certain level, I understand that. But don't go down the road of isolates just because it's the easiest thing to do, because that's not honouring the plant as a whole. Um, and I think as, you know, if you want to get into the industry, please honour it and please give what we really, what you really, really can. And at the moment we can give more than isolates. So don't go down the road of isolates, please, because they, they're, they're not good enough. Um, and, and they're certainly not as good as a whole plant. Um, so that's what I would say to people getting into industry is please honour the plant. Please do what's right by the plant and try to give people whole plant as much as you possibly can. And don't secede to their pressures. To, um, to go down the isolate route just because it's easier. Um, again, I suppose we're, sort of, we're activists. We're, we're in the industry, but we're not. We're not in the industry to profit. So it's more a case of my opinion or my experience directly. I have been lucky enough to travel uh, to five legal states in America. I've experienced the Moroccan um, system, which is actually just you're the right kind of your tourist so you get it there are places around the world where you treat differently for different reasons what i want to see in this industry is ubiquity access for everybody i'm bored of branding that is overly specific specified to one niche demographic we're seeing that this further divides and erodes the argument we see it with recreational versus medical we're seeing it with hemp versus cannabis we're seeing it with cbd versus thc this is all cannabis sativa L. It's all this wonderful plant, this genus, that our ancestors nurtured from one small corner of the planet to be ubiquitous everywhere. Its usage means that we can negate the petroleum paradigm. We can save our planet. We can change the world, but only if we honor the planet. Only if we're humble enough to actually do what it almost wants us to do, which is save our damn selves, which saves the rest of life on this earth with it. So what I want to see is the end of plastic packaging. Use hemp, we have more than enough. Use mushroom-based uh, packaging. We have such technologies at our disposal that frankly and fortunately are not at display today because they're not profitable. But what is the point of the pursuit of profit if prohibition proliferates? What is the point of us being able to make money from this plant if 10 years from now you're not alive to spend it? What people need to do, I can't speak from the business point of view, because I'm not in business, uh, so I'm not paid. Um, so I can't give you any business advice. Other people here have to give you business advice about sales and marketing. But I think anyone, uh, first of all, should stop being scared of cannabis. 
they should stop being scared of THC. They should accept that hemp and cannabis are the same plants. Semantically, it's the same word. The hemp is the Germanic root, and uh, cannabis is the Greek, the Greek and Scythian root. Um, the sativa means cultivated from the Latin. It's, it's one of the same thing. Uh, so stop being scared of it. Uh, Honour the plant. You do need to have the whole flower. I've only ever had the whole flower. I've managed my entire health since pharmaceutical drugs nearly killed me with nothing but the flower. I don't even know what isolates are because I am poor and I can't afford any of those great products. So for me, I suppose, uh, what can anyone do? Get yourself some cannabis seeds, go home, grow your own cannabis, make your own cannabis products for yourself. Buy the ones that are available if you can. And if you get arrested, go not guilty all the way and challenge the charges because there's no foundation evidence for the harm of cannabis. So if they have this no foundation of harm, of evidence, how can they prosecute you? So um, that's my advice as to what an individual, a person can do, is challenge this whole paradigm. And I would call on every industry here. If you all united actually together and challenged the Home Office, because why are they taking away the rest of this plant from us? Why are they denying us this plant? Why can I not have flowers? Why can I not have THC? And I, I don't believe there should be a limit either, because if you leave a limit in law, then you'll always have a niche market that will be fulfilled by somebody else. And that means harm, potential. So the only way to do it is to uh, ubiquitous access, full regulation for those that want to buy it, and allow people that like me to carry on growing at home in peace without the fear of your door being kicked down, losing your home, years in prison, because I can homebrew alcohol, drink myself to death and give it to my friends to drink themselves to death, or I can grow fruit and vegetables to nourish my health. Cannabis is perhaps the most nutritious herb on the planet, maintains all of our body systems, so why cannot the poorest people in the world have a seed, grow it and nurture themselves? my endocannabinoid system with it. So that's what I say, grow your own. Thank you for that. I um, just want to clarify my question a little bit. As an individual, yes, I'm getting into the industry, I'm looking at the business aspect of it, but that's not what I'm concerned about. The business aspect is just to step into the industry to learn more about, to educate myself. However, what is it that I can do as an individual by helping people like yourselves who are activists who are out there, for example, what you said, grow the plant yourself, you know, do something at home, do something that makes a change. What is it that we can actually do to help you to get these regulations changed, get the laws changed, make these MPs and members of parliament actually hear what we have to say about it. So what can I as an individual do to assist this movement. Okay, I, I think as an individual, what we can all do is take ourselves out of that system, and that is to grow our own, look after ourselves, and take ourselves away from. Don't rely on them, on them in the first place. And, and actually, as me, as, as an individual activist, what I need individuals to do is help their friends and family around them, because I can't keep helping everybody. I have at least two or three hundred people a, a month come to me begging me for illegal oil, and I help them as many as I can. And so what I need to do is I need their friends and their loved ones to make that oil for them, not me. Yeah. I need the one, you know, look around you in your family. If you've got someone who's in pain in your family, you look after them. Yeah. Why am I looking after them? So that's what I need you to do as an individual, is start to look at your, your, low, you know, your, your small community and see who needs the help. And then get a collective, start growing, start making, start producing oils, not for sale, but just for you know, in a collective. And look after yourselves, because then you won't rely on pharmaceuticals, you'll take yourself out of that system and their system will crash. The other thing is, is that we need to also stop focusing on just single molecule, uh, uh, you know, consumption. Uh, single molecule consumption, you know, with when you're talking CBD, you know, it's it seems to be uh, socially, it, it seems to be something that's not feared, you know. But when you start talking about whole plant, when you start talking about, uh, you know, full spectrum oils, this starts to to create some sort of uh, anxiety with, with with the community as a whole. This is not something that has ever really been dangerous throughout society. So 
when you ask what you can do for us is more what you can do for yourselves is, is really educate yourselves, find your voice, be able to collectively within your, your communities, with, within uh, the different cities or parts of this country, start organizing, start actually speaking about the truths and the access that, that our ancestors had, uh, the application of all of the things that they used this plant for, one of which uh, was health and well-being. Others were for industrial purposes. All of these things help us uh, with regards to being an activist, it all helps to uh, really dispel uh, the fears and falsehoods that have created the situation and the understanding that we all uh, know about or share or push back against today. Because there's so much information that is based in truth uh, that is available, but we're not seeking it out. We're, we're, we're not educating ourselves to the point where when you stand up within your communities that your voice has power, it has meaning, there's substance there. And and so the things that you can do is is literally find your voice. And and, and that is, is what we've done in the United States. We've had you know large crowds at different rallies, anywhere from 10,000 folks to half a million folks stand up at, at, at a single event and, and demand <coughs> the access and the opportunity to work, to grow with, and, and, to, and to, to possess this plant that has been a part of all of our cultures, not just what's in the United States, not what's just been done in here in Europe, but around the globe for thousands of years. And it's that mentality, it's that, it's, it's that foundation that you can stand on that will eventually change the understanding of what is happening and how it's happening here in, in, in England. Um, for me personally, I suppose, uh, s support Durham's upcoming event. Um, help your local communities. You'd be surprised how much clubs thrive. I know of organizations in the UK that have been going decades, selling cannabis that is well grown, that is paying for kids to go to college, that is putting meals on tables, that is funding all of this. We like to call it the black market. It is not. It is the real market. What these people are trying to create and gentrify and take from us is our heritage and our culture, not just our ancient history, but our recent history. Throughout the time of prohibition, we have defended this plant. We have fortified our culture. We're trying to envision what this post-prohibition paradigm looks like. And ultimately, what I would say is support organizations like We The Undersigned, support the UKCSC, support anybody that is trying to do, to do something in the right path, but don't be placated by it. Don't just give some money to somebody and go, I'm done. Ooh, I signed a petition, I'm done. Please don't. Be brave enough that when you walk down the street and you hear somebody going, ooh, that skunk weed. Stop, give them two minutes of your day. Give them half an hour, give them an hour if you can. Please, speak to your friends, your colleagues, your family, all of the people around you that are they're so filled with, with ignorance and hatred and propaganda from the mainstream media and from 80 to 100 years of, frankly, bullshit. These are lies, frank, flat-out lies. They profit from the sale of cannabis in this country. We're the most prolific grower of medical cannabis in this country. So don't let them lie to you. Be brave enough to speak your truth. If you consume cannabis, be proud. Take a step from our gay and, and bi and transgender brothers and sisters. You know what I mean? Be proud to step out and admit who you are. Don't be ashamed of what you do. They are wrong, not you. So ultimately, if you help yourselves, which is what we've been saying in that sense, you don't need to help us, because many hands make light work and there will be no more war to fight. I'm going to keep it on point if I can, because I have a tendency of sidetracking. What can you do? Unity. Uh, strength in numbers, and I would again refer, refer to the people that fought for their right for their sexual preferences or for coloured rights or for female rights, uh, is only through strength of numbers. So first of all, I believe in unity, so step out to your local clubs, whoever it is, get out. If you haven't got a local club, make a local club. Right? There are loads of information and loads of models on how to make a club. So um, make your club and create unity, uh, and then something... Um, Again, referring back to those three oppressed peoples, communities that we've had in our cultural past from the establishment, oppressing people who they didn't approve of that particular way of life. 
They made it not about an act, they made it about culture. And that's what cannabis is. It's not about a plant, it's about the culture of the cannabis community. It's about our beliefs, our practices, what we do as individuals together in our social spaces. It's the fact that we are denied the right to a social life because you have no right to freedom of association if you use cannabis. Alcohol, you can socialize, not if you use cannabis. So by becoming together in people, making it about culture, having social spaces, you're challenging this uh, paradigm of prohibition, as you call it. Um, and then, what was my third one? Sugar. I just saw some in the car, I lost my train. Ah, honesty. Honesty, yeah? Honesty and integrity. Be honest. Now, I don't say proud because pride cometh before the fall. And I don't believe uh, pride is one of the seven deadly sins. So I don't encourage pridefulness, as many people who know me would have heard me bang on about for ages. Honour. Have honour and on honesty. So when you see someone and you hide your cannabis use or your beliefs about cannabis, you're being dishonest. You're being dishonest to yourself, you're being dishonest to the person that you are having any kind of relationship with whatsoever. And if you're honest, if your relationship is based on dishonesty, you have no relationship. You might as well chuck it in the bin because it's based on lies. And that is the same if it's hiding the sexuality or the fact that I use cannabis. So, um, having hidden the fact I use cannabis from when I was 16, I was a teacher, I didn't hide, I hid it all through then. Only when my health depended on it, and I needed died four times, that the laws no longer scare me, did I get rid of that fear. So you have to get rid of the fear, because it's the fear that binds the mind. So get rid of the shackles of fear. The laws are based on lies. Stop being scared of them. Unite as a people. Celebrate your culture. Be honest with anyone you meet. Anyone and everyone. The purest form of activism to me I mean, I, I risked my life. I, mean, I could go to prison for sitting here and saying, I grow my own cannabis. That's 14 years in prison for you, sunshine. Okay. Uh, but when you're in the queue at the post office, on the bus, in going to school, on the way to work, tell everyone about cannabis. Um, and you see these people on a daily basis in the rhythms of your life. So when you're this honest with these people, they'll either come to you and you'll gain more strength, but well, they might judge you because they've been conditioned by the lies of the government, which I've got the paperwork to prove, by the way, uh, which will be in our case when we find the assembly. Uh, you get strength when you haven't got the fear, you've got the unity, you've got the culture. You tell everyone. And they'll either support you, even if they don't use cannabis, because they believe in freedom and equality, or they'll turn against you. And if those people turn against you, the question is, do you want them in your life anyway? My answer, I've learned the hard way, is no. I lost most of my blood family turned against me because of cannabis and my activism. A lot of my friends and work colleagues, I was a teacher, turned against me. Uh, I now have some very good quality friends. We call them Canafam. Yeah? I'm hoping Dan might be that. We've got to have a smoke later when we get down to it. Uh, you make more friends. You might lose people when you're honest. But with your honesty, you gain more people. And you gain honest people. Uh, and you're all of the same mind and belief and then your community comes and community gives strength and they break us by dividing us divided we are weak so that's my answer unite to conquer If people are having um, detrimental side effects from their cannabis use, it's down to prohibition because they can't have access to cannabis that actually works for them. Because there's over 5,000 different strains, and each strain works differently. <laughs> and there's, there's many, many different ailments. Like, for instance, myself, I can't have really, really high THC. It does my anxiety no good, so guess what? I don't have it. 
But I know some people like my son in the front who needs high THC, so guess what? He has it. Now that's in an illegal market because there is no market out there where I can go into a pharmacy and say, I need this, I need this, I need this. That's what we need. That comes with, a la without prohibition, we have regulation. And with regulation comes harm reduction. It's the only way we're gonna stop harm reduction is if we stop prohibition. And, and, and there's not anything wrong with, with regulation. Regulation lets you know that your product that you're ingesting, smoking, uh, using topically or sublingually in, in, you know, in and on your body is, is safe to use. So regulation is great. On the other, on the other side, you know, every body is different. And as, as she said, you know, there are different strains that will create different effects and, you know, you really have to judge for yourself how to, how to use this product, you know, how to, how to define what does work for you. And, you don't have to smoke an entire joint or you know take a gram of, of of concentrate you take very small amounts you see what it happens you see what it does how you physiologically respond to it and and these things will help you understand either what works for you what doesn't work for you what helps you to feel better what elevates your mood to the point where maybe you're not depressed what what su what suppresses your anxiety so you feel that uh, you're, you're not as anxious uh, around, you know, a business or driving your car or, you know, find, find what works for you. On the other side of this is I know and I've seen at least uh, from the television in, in the United States that you all have the ability to, to stand up and be heard because when our crazy freaking president came to the UK, you all went out into the streets in numbers that I was absolutely in love with. I, 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 the fact that you blew up a, a giant Trump and paraded it around for the baby that he is, the voices that were there, the energy was, that was there to say, this person shouldn't be here, that same energy, that same intention should be used within this space to talk about this product and these plants and this access. And you have the voice. You don't need me to tell you I've seen it. Take your power back, find your voices, stand up and be heard. Yes. Um, well, this is quite interesting. I work quite intimately with my local police force. Uh, we did a thing where I was, went through a community championship. They paid for me to do a course with several of their officers to learn how to better engage with the community. I taught them as much as I could about every drug, about my experience of taking most drugs and having quite a, a rough upbringing. This softened their edges to recognize that actually, yes, it is the harms of prohibition that are far more than the plant. At the end of one of the meetings with my local sergeant, who basically said, we want to refer people where we're finding on the street to use, so then go to the clubs, then get safe organic tested cannabis regulated under our model that's beneficial for the community. He then said, there's these two teenagers though, and they're stealing everything that isn't nailed down to buy skunk. And I went, mate, do you know it's skunk? Is it skunk number one? Is it sweet skunk? Is it super skunk? What kind of skunk? And he immediately got on the back foot. I explained to him about the different strains and about whatever else. He apologized for the derogatory term. Then he went on to go, okay then, why are they doing this? Because they're, they're buying for 20 pounds, 1.6, 20 bags. When for 40 pounds at home, they can grow an ounce of organic, clean tested cannabis. A lot of the psychotic episodes and a lot of the issues that people are having with cannabis side effects, the consequences of its cultivation under prohibition. The substances that are added to it, pesticides, uh, there's then various molds that cause things like aspergillosis. The main side effect of that is psychosis. There's also the, the unbelievable mountain of data that shows that 77% of Europeans mix it with tobacco. Tobacco is a, tobacco is a known psychosis inducing substance. There's your issue. We've been looking at this the wrong direction. So if you want to protect the youth, we legalize, we regulate, we proliferate. You use the same thing I do every time. It's education, education, education. That's the only way out of this. Yeah. Sorry, I'm so exhausted, you won't believe it. Oh my goodness me. What's the question, boss? You can some anxiety was what you mentioned, wasn't it, specifically? And the side effects of cannabis. Um, okay. <laughs> So far, everything that everybody else mentioned, all of that above. Um, the only way to ever be able to protect about it is to be able to know what it is, which currently nobody can. 
Um, the reason I decided to start growing my own actually was so I could choose the right ratios of CBD and THC that I wanted. I could dry and cure it for myself, go organic for myself. I knew I didn't have a grow slave growing it or anything like that. It was all morally safe and ethic. So on that basis, um, if we didn't have prohibition, took it all away, we had it like, if you have alcohol, which is poison, you go in a shop and you know what ratio, what percentage, what strength. That alone will help. Like Callie has learned the hard way, THC aggravates her anxiety. So she generally will have less THC. The amount of THC I use would put most people um, inactive for a period of time. The amount of cannabis I've used today to be in front of you, and that isn't CBD, it's full on THC cannabis. Most of you'd sleep for a week perhaps, but I'm here and I'm functioning because that's what I need to get going. With regards to the mental health issue, uh, I'm going to draw on Harvard University, I can't remember the year at the minute, 2000 something. They looked at the schizophrenia psychosis, which is one that this country is most prominently worried about. And they found from their studies, to summarise quite quickly, that in order to prevent one episode of a, what they call a transient schizophrenic episode, or short-term psychotic episode, you have to, they, they use the word um, prevent, 4,000 people consuming, which translates to you need to destroy the lives of 3,999 people through criminalization, prosecution and discrimination to protect one person from a transient schizophrenic episode that is likely triggered from an unbalanced levels of cannabinoids that is aggravated to their situation and their condition. In other words, regulation would solve the problem, education would solve the problem, and then also as Callie learned the hard way, experience is the final answer because as we will often say to anyone that doesn't know anything about cannabis, low and slow, uh, if you go to the doctors and they prescribe a drug for you, they also go low and slow. They don't chuck you on a maximum dose. Uh, I know from myself from side effect stuff, uh, there's reasons for that. So it's the same with cannabis. As, as Dan mentioned, you can have your joint, you can put it down. The balls are a different game, respect them. Uh, and it's about experience, knowledge, and that's it. But currently, all of this fear of mental health is exaggerated and blown out of proportion uh, and used to create fear to maintain the, the prohibition paradigm that our medical cannabis is safe and your street recreational cannabis is dangerous. And the fact is, cannabis is cannabis. I grow Jack here a strain, which was your good dad's strain. Uh, Bedrocan is sold by the Dutch government for thousands of pounds. They call it a medical strain. They're both the same strain. So cannabis is cannabis. It's what you use it for. Thank you. Yeah, but they need to be educated. We try. <laughs> See, this is what happens with it. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys. Wonderful discussion. Thank you very much.